Welcome to the Telecom Exchange CEO Roundtables, both for our guests here at Telecom Exchange NYC and for our viewers who are joining us from RCR TV and JSA TV. Thank you. Our third panel today is on the hot topic of telemedicine. It's the telemedicine revolution, big data, IoT, and 5G leading the way. And we are very honored to have Larry Walsh, the CEO of the 2112 Group, a seasoned journalist, analyst, author, and industry commentator. Larry is also the founder of Channelnomics, which is a leading provider of IT channel news and analysis, a specialist in the development and execution of channel programs, disruptive sales models, and growth strategies for companies of all sizes. From startups to Fortune 500s, Larry's worked with a roster of diverse technology players including Ingram Micro, Intel Security, SAP, and oh, Verizon right here on our panel. So go ahead and welcome Larry Walsh. Larry? Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to start by talking about why we're having this conversation today. And uh, I, I tend to, as, as Jamie says, you know, when what my company and I do is strategy. We look at the world around us and we try to imagine how to make it different and then try to bring routes to market to it or apply routes to market to it. And lately, the questions that we've been getting have been around, you know, how's the world going to look in the future? Well, it's, you know, it's, somewhat, it's not really a silly question. We're already living in it. We were just having, the panelists and I were just having a conversation about video phones that were introduced in the 60s that, you know, didn't really work, but now we have them for free. When we start talking about telemedicine, the conversation gets vastly different. And it's not because of the technology, it's about demographics. So by, what is it, 2045, we will have worldwide 441 cities with more than a million people in population. You know, imagine that because it's, it's truly, the globe is urbanizing and it's urbanizing rapidly. And many of the cities that we're talking about are, are, are urban centers that we've never heard of. Combine that with what is happening in terms of life expectancy. So currently, the average life expectancy is 71 years globally. If you're lucky enough to live in a more developed country, like we are, the life expectancy is about 85. Now, fortunately for women, it's a little bit higher, you know, so you get a little bit of peace from us. <laughs> but it does start to exasper exasperate the healthcare industry and the healthcare capacity. Because with that life expectancy, what's happening simultaneously, even though you see these, this urbanization, this migration towards urban centers, we're also seeing a decline in birth rate. So most of the Western, most of the Western and developed countries are actually in negative population growth. You know, the United States, you know, just for instance, the United States is on the cusp of going into a negative population growth. Other countries, Japan, Germany, Italy, are all in decline in terms of population. The Japanese are investing, investing heavily in robotics, not for the, not for the industrial manufacturing capacity, but to care for their elderly. So when we start talking about things like telemedicine and automation in healthcare, it's not necessarily about applying technology because we can. It's because we're doing it out of necessity. We simply do not have the manpower to care for, our, for the people, particularly if you think about it. We spend today $6.5 trillion globally on healthcare. And most of that spend is on the last two years of life. So when we start looking at the demographic trends and we start looking at the cost and we start looking at the decline in talent. You know, if you look at, if you just look across North America and Europe, we're importing healthcare providers because we simply cannot grow enough, grow enough fast enough domestically. So telemedicine is really about applying our resources in such a way that we can gain the economies of scale and provide a quality of life for the population and to augment the limited resources that we have. A lot of this is, as Jamie said, you know, is coming about because we are in a position to where technology is caught up with our imagination. And if you hear me talk about, you know, in other, in other venues, you'll hear me talk about 
that our imagination is actually outpacing our ability to deliver. But we are actually at the intersection of where these, tr these mega trends in technology of big data and high speed ubiquitous networks are converging to allow us to give us the capacity and the ability to deliver technology in ways that we thought weren't, pr weren't possible before. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the evolution of the telecom inf infrastructure, the ability to pass data across wide areas around the world, and to be able to apply technologies from mobile devices, cloud computing, big data, and automation to improve quality of life and to deliver healthcare in places where, they can't be, where it hasn't been available before. So we have a great panel here, and I want to start with uh, Brian Prophet of Adtel. Brian, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself, and also why don't you tell us about, you know, if you have a telemedicine or a remote health experience. Sure. So, uh, again, Brian Prophet from Adtel. I've spent 18 years in the industry, primarily in a role working for carriers, but in an advocacy role working with Internet2, National Lambda Rail, uh, NIH, NASA, NOAA, working through being able to be the advocate to the carriers to be able to partner on these advanced research networks for healthcare, for education, for research. Uh, personally, I ditched the Fitbit uh, about a year ago. Uh, from that standpoint, I found that it was very few places that I was not carrying my phone. Uh, so I thought letting an app do that was, uh, was a little easier from uh, actually wearing it one more device. Very good. Uh, next on the panel, Felipe Alvarez, the CEO of Axion Fiber Networks. Felipe? Uh, hi, Felipe Alvarez, uh, CEO of Axion Fiber Networks. We're a, a provider of uh, datacoms, um, telecoms, I'm sorry, uh, high capacity infrastructure services in New York. Um, my experience in healthcare is really tied to being that fiber provider that connects uh, sites, uh, primarily data centers, you know, high end, very high end things. So my interest in this panel is really, I mean, what's happening with uh, the evolution of uh, taking broadband essentially to the rest, you know, in many cases, I mean, and how that impacts uh, delivery of services, basically. Uh, so it, it moves to what I, uh, I read about, which is in sort of the IoT is the IOP, which is the Internet of Patients, right? <laughs> I'm going to steal that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next, Cliff Kane, the co-CEO of Clarion Fiber Networks. Cliff? Yeah, hi. Uh, Cliff Kane, co-CEO of uh, Clarion Fiber Networks. We are a uh, New York area um, telecommunication services provider, primarily focused on uh, the wholesale community. We sell to carriers, but we are extending that uh, into the uh, enterprise space. Um, I have no, uh, I've been thinking about it. I don't have a uh, any device that is, uh, I don't use Fitbit or anything like that to carry a phone with no apps that, uh, that monitor my health. I guess uh, I feel I'm healthy enough. <laughs> But you know, our uh, you know our interest here is because we are um, have been a strong proponents of what's happening on the edge, especially in light of uh, 5G and IoT coming on board, and what is the infrastructure going to have to look like to support that? And telemedicine, you know, is is a lot of different um, applications within telemedicine. But if you look at it holistically, uh, it a lot of that's going to all happen on the edge, and it's going to be about how you transport that data back and forth to. Uh, uh, to um, uh, storage, uh, to, uh, to different physicians to get diagnosis and, and the like. So the edge is, you know, of critical importance to us, and and I think that supports the whole telemedicine uh, infrastructure. Yeah. Okay. Next, Drew Mullen, the senior vice president of business development and strategy at Light Tower Fiber Networks. Drew. Yeah, I do not have a Fitbit either, so I think that uh, we're going to take down the average uh, age on this panel there. Um, my name is uh, Drew Mullen. I'm SVP of Business Development and Strategy for Light Tower Fiber Networks. So we build and operate fiber networks across the East Coast, um, and uh, we've got about 33 route miles, 33,000 route miles of network um, that we offer up. Um, you know, this morning someone talked about trying to predict how much uh, bandwidth, you know, is, is going to be coming from uh, Internet of Things or telemedicine. 
I'm a fiber guy, so I don't care what the thing, we can just throw more fiber at it. And that's the answer for a fiber guy always. Um, you know, telemedicine here, uh, I'm excited about this because I think telemedicine is very personal, um, personal for everybody in this room. Just a, a quick uh, little thing about me. Uh, my wife is a pediatrician and my father-in-law is an orthopedic surgeon. Um, so in preparation for this, uh, my wife doesn't know anything about fiber, but she actually gave me some things about uh, how she does what she does and how the telecommunications and the fiber world are solving those, those problems. So um, this, this past weekend, I was, uh, I was at a, uh, a softball tournament with my 17-year-old daughter, and she's a catcher. Um, which if you've got kids, never have them be a catcher. But um, so my, uh, my daughter was catching and a girl came up to play. She was really large and she had a really long swing and she wound up catching my daughter on her hand uh, as she was doing that. So meanwhile, we immediately go to the emergency room or whatever. She gets her hand scanned. You know, we're there for about eight hours. And finally they came back and they said, you know, okay, you're good to go. And we said, what took so long for this? And they said, well, the person that needed to read the scan wasn't here. They were actually on break, and then they got you know involved with other stuff. And I and I said, really? And they said, yeah, this should, probably should have taken an hour for you to get in and out of here. And I said, just because that one person wasn't there. And I thought, here's a really practical way. And, and you know, that sort of affected me, and I'm sure everyone here has kids or a parent or something else that telemedicine's going to affect you. So. Um, you know, that's, that's sort of my personal, most recent story. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Good. And last but not least, of course, Nancy Green, the Global Healthcare Business Development and Strategy Executive Leader from Verizon. Hi. So I come at this from a completely different lens than all this. I live telemedicine and, and work within telemedicine probably for the last 15 years. I've been in healthcare for 25 years around the technology, not a clinician. So, um, but, uh, so. And the, the role that I have with, if you think about Verizon, most people go, what in the world do, do, are they doing in the healthcare space? So I to, um, kind of set the stage, I'm one of five vertical leads. So I lead healthcare, there's another one for media entertainment, uh, insurance, uh, or I take insurance now, there's uh, energy utilities, things like that. So they pulled from the industry to say, how can we use all of the size and scope and scale that Verizon has to apply to a vertical's business problem? So telemedicine has been a healthcare business problem for a very long time. Uh, and it's not a technology problem. It is a workflow problem, which you just identified, and an interoperability problem, period. Um, and and as, you, as we go further, I can talk more about that. But I really, it's not about the technology. There is an age thing <coughs> with physicians who want to use it and who doesn't. But I would probably ask, how many of you have ever done a virtual visit, a video call with, their, with your physician? Three, <laughs> four. Um, it, it's... it's uh, uh, every one of the insurance carriers offers this as a service to keep you out of the emergency rooms, and no one uses it. So it is there. It has to do with how the business problem is looked at by the industry. If I'm a payer or a provider world, it's vastly different, and who's paying for it? So it's not. It's just now, in the last couple of years, gotten to be reimbursed. So this whole tel you know telemedicine covers a huge area, lots of different ways to, to operate. It's not just it's not just video. It is just the movement of of information back and forth. Yeah. Right. All right. So as Jamie said, this is a round table. It's not a panel discussion. So let's be a little non-traditional. If you have a question and you want to get involved in the conversation, which I encourage you to do, I have a bunch of questions here, and I'm not afraid to use them. <laughs> but it would be far better if we all participated in this, because it's going to touch all of us at some point or another. But I want to come back to you. Know, and, and Nancy, I was going to start with you with, a, with one of the prepared questions. But I think you just said something very interesting. This isn't new. Mm -mm. We've been talking about telemedicine and remote healthcare delivery for the better part of a decade. <clears throat> I, I remember, you know, I think it was 10 years ago, Cisco showing off using their telepresence technology to do remote, remote um, examinations and cl uh, clinics. So why isn't it? Why isn't it more prevalent? Probably two things. The biggest has to do with reimbursement. Uh, it wasn't reimbursed for a very long time. Uh, certain states didn't reimburse you, like Texas finally just passed, I live in Dallas, finally just passed that you didn't have to see a doctor first before you did a telemedicine visit. So then um, the payers weren't paying for it, or they would pay $25, where if you went to the doctor, he'd get $100. So the doctor didn't particularly want to do it. So the reimbursement is happening. Uh, it's getting there. It's not fixed, but it's getting there. And I think, But I think if you look at it from the push of how the industry works, if you look at the the four or five main areas in healthcare, they're trying to increase the access to care. 
while improving the quality of care. So, and I always use this in New York City because you probably don't know this, within the New York City area, the five boroughs, there are six areas that are considered federally underserved by physicians. It is not a rural problem. Uh, so physicians go where they want to live, not necessarily where the patients are. We have you know, cases of cities who pay for doctors to go to school and to just operate in that area. So um, they're trying to lower cost, increase access to care, increase quality of care. But now the entire focus is on patient experience and clinician experience. And the clinician experience almost overrides a little bit of the patient experience. So as the clinicians start to put it into their workflow, it gets part of their business. You gotta understand if you asked your father-in-law, he's done the same thing, the same way since he went to med school. And you introduce a telemedicine, you have to introduce it into that workflow. And they are probably, what, a 100 plus year old system of doing it the same way. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's difficult. And so when someone puts together a, a, a program to interconnect um, and have a virtual visit in your rounding, we've had hospitals who have put together a room in a hospital because they round in a floor. They put a room in there that's a video room. And so he goes and grabs the chart, goes into, you know, so just to get it part of the flow. Okay. Right? So, well, yeah, other than, if I could ask this, because. From a telemedic tele, the tele component of our medicine, <laughs> telemedicine, the not only the technology advances, but the penetration of readily available, reliable broadband, right, has increased dramatically over the last. I got to say, it goes up every year, but certainly the last ten years, uh, especially on the wireless side, you have gotten advances that allow a lot of that information to happen with enough. Uh, sufficient latency and clarity and so on and so yeah, forth that you can not actually a technology problem right because uh, so it's not a delivery you need a fiber pair into right. the physician's office ideally yeah you would but you don't have to anymore yeah. so some of that drives adoption of better economics because think about the premiums I mean what mm -hmm. happens when you start kind of yeah. leveraging technology to do that remote diagnostics remote uh, testing, you know, remote yeah, visits and things like that. The information from it is more important than the actual interception. So if you're doing a video uh, consultation, the doctor can do a lot of what he's normally used, he or she's normally used to doing. If you're moving data from remote monitoring equipment, anything that's in a hospital or at home, that's just pieces of data that is overwhelming to the medical community. They want it put in context. So once it's put in context and the smarts are put around it, it makes it usable data and actionable for them to make a better health decision for you. Otherwise, it's just data. So to answer your question, it, it's been so long that it's just a lot of data, which is how many people have stopped wearing the Fitbit. Most doctors don't care if you walk unless he's an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> he cares when you put a brand new hip in you, are you taking 10,000 steps a day? But So it's, it's that whole data just went, okay, here, doctor, here's all my stuff. And he's like, that's nice, thanks. So it was, it, now it's starting to get, like, if I can get context around it, I'm good. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out who said 10,000 steps was the right level. I still don't know <laughs> that either. So I, I'm just going to throw this out to the panel, because before we get up to the application layer of all this, because a lot of great magic can happen up there, but, and Phil, you said it, is that we have the infrastructure for it. Is it the long haul infrastructure that we have, and is the, is the last mile there? Or do, are we looking at that we have enough infrastructure to support a, a true saturation of the market with, you know, that have ubiquitous use of telemedicine? So I'll, I'll let everybody answer on this. Well, I'll take a shot at that. Please, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's location specific. I, I, you know, it, you could be someplace where, you know, the doctors may have good infrastructure to support uh, telemedicine and, and some high uh, bandwidth applications, but uh, the patients that are using that those doctors um, are trying to uh, diagnose, maybe some places that aren't. You know, one potential uh, remedy for that would be to, to create centers where the, the patients could you know basically come in and they could have the the broadband connectivity and uh, and telepresence that you need to uh, to conduct a, a good diagnosis. But I I think it's it's the same story as as, as broadband across the country. It, it's really very location specific. You have Thousands of buildings in, in New York City that don't even have fiber in them. I mean, that's uh, commercial buildings. So uh, that, uh, as one perspective on that, it, it's just, um, I think it depends on where you are. Yeah, yeah. and just to add, add to that, I mean, from Light Tower's perspective, healthcare continues to grow. I mean, we've been in the space for 15 years now, and every year we're amazed at how much more 
bandwidth these hospitals are using and and finding ways to do it. So whether they have dark fiber or gig E or 100 gig, they can, it's like closet space. As soon as you have it, you know, you need a little bit more. Um, and, and so, you know, about 10% of our revenues are, are uh, healthcare related and continues to grow. Yep. And, Brian, please. Thank you. Um, and I think one of the things to keep in mind too, you know, the core backbone is not the issue. You know, the, the big shiny hospital buildings are not the ones that have problems getting the connectivity to them. You know, the, the business model works there to get fiber to them. And if the carriers won't do it, you know, it's easy enough whether in a large city or the second and third tier markets for the carriers, you know, the hospitals to justify building out fiber rings themselves if they can't get it through wholesale available fiber. I think what you have to start looking at is getting, you know, as we talked about getting closer to the edge, you know, when you go to that clinic for the emergency center, and these emergency centers are popping up everywhere because pushing healthcare to the edge is the same as pushing data to the edge. When you start looking at it from a standpoint of bringing these things to the edge, being able to, you know, have an x-ray machine, x-ray the hand at the, you know, the clinic near the baseball field, if there's somebody in a, in a data center type environment, you know, of radiologists that are able to re read that and provide real-time feedback. This is how you start having remote care. This is how you start bringing that to the edge. And when you start looking at, is it a last mile or a backbone issue, I think you have to start looking at, you know, to justify that, it's not just the backbone of the hospitals. You have to start looking at the ecosystem of healthcare in the communities, be, to the doctor's offices, to the labs. You know, and that creates opportunity to justify some of that metro expansion when you start looking at you know, kind of the schools, the hospitals, the libraries, again, as an ecosystem in a neighborhood. So the, the tenet of, of that driver of increasing access to care means that they have to, to, what he just said, they have to push care as far out as they can, which then gets into the problems of how do we get information there, how do we communicate back. And that's in a clinical environment, to your point, you know, or, or whoever said it, to go to a center to be able to do that. The bigger driver is this whole consumerism model is that I don't want to go somewhere. I should be able to do it off my phone. I do everything else off my phone. And that's driven them to change their business model and come up into a very competitive world. So some of the very unique solutions that you have um, can have you compete in, in a marketplace. So an MSK or you know, Sloan Kettering can compete with someone here in the local market that is doing the same thing, but being able to offer some type of service that allows them to do something unique. Because they're now as a consumer, think of yourself as a consumer, you've done your research, uh, you're not really loyal to your brand, right? I'm trying to think of my New York hospital, sorry. Um, uh, you're not typically loyal to that, just that brand. You can go to whoever you want to, so whoever is advertising the best or whoever has the best ranking, whatever that is, you're going to go that way. And so this whole piece of being able to offer services that are unique in their, in their specialties is something that's pushing them because of the consumer side of the business. What's driving, what's driving the adoption, though? Is, that, is, it, the, is it a capacity issue that the, the, the clinicians, the hospitals, the, 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 the physicians' offices or practices are coming in saying that we need to scale more, we need to connect to these resources? Is it a regulatory, is the regulatory climate changing where the government is coming in saying that we have to, we have to automate and we have to do more sharing? What's the driver behind, behind the trend? I think it's money. Yeah. I mean, I, at the end of the day, if you look at where most of our health care is at and where the biggest expense is going to be in the next decade of Medicare and Medicaid, you've got to look at how the, you know, the payers will look at telemedicine. You know, there's three categories that they look at, you know, and that you start looking at real-time, you know, interactive visits, you start looking at, you know, store and process of data, and then you start looking at remote monitoring. Those are the three reimbursable categories. The problem has been really just as an adoption happens, to Nancy's point, for a very long time, you know, over the past decade or so, as the technology stopped being the problem, it really became a process of the only thing that was coverable was real-time interactive. You had to be looking at the doctor and, and working with them. It couldn't be the step in between. It couldn't be a remote call center full of radiologists reading x-rays and providing that feedback back. That wasn't a reimbursable expense because that wasn't a, re you know, the radiologist didn't walk in and go, okay, this looks great, and the doctor didn't come in and look at the x-ray to look at the report that the radiologist gave them to say, yep, it's broken, or no, it's not. Yeah, that's a monetary decision. Yeah, the only thing I'd add, I'd agree with Brian that, that it is 
a monetary decision, but I mean, the quality of the care that you also get from that is a key benefit. And I think, you know, in a healthcare environment, you know, doctors don't discount the fact that they're trying to give the best care, you know, to their patients. Always. Always. So, you know, certainly there's the, the monetary aspect where it's more efficient, but I think that it's also just better quality of care. My, my wife uh, does the newborn nursery, um, so when she has to discharge a child, she has her, cell, her smartphone there, and she gets these, you know, Billy Rubin tests, and she has literally a, a thing that comes up, pops up on her phone that this test got back, should I discharge this, you know, this baby or not? And, you know, in the old times, you, you know, you wouldn't get that. And you might be in the hospital for another five, six hours before the doctor sees it. Now she hits the dope, okay, Billy Rubin's good, off the baby goes. You know, so that family's happier with the, with the care that they got, too. And, uh, you know, it was probably more cost efficient, too. Well, and, it, and it's about that real-time information, to Drew's point. I, I mean, it's, you know, I, Pre-telecom, the first 10 years of my life, I was an EMT and, you know, did that professionally. And I think there's a lot of the time where it's that real-time information. It's triage, right? If they, if they say that my hand's broken, you know, if they said your daughter's hand was broken, it doesn't mean you're not going to follow up with a proper orthopedic surgeon for the proper level of care. But being able to make a decision, you know, in 30 minutes, we took the x-ray, we had a picture, we knew there was a fracture. Now I know what to do next. You cut eight hours of time and management and, and you know, interaction from that experience of that care to the to the person to the consumer to the point this is really what it starts looking at from a consumerism of healthcare yeah i think if you talk about adoption and i'm thinking as we as people were talking it's really around in healthcare we call them service lines so ed is a service line um uh um uh, dermatology is a service line that kind of stuff so cardiology is a service line so uh they're use case driven and some have better adoption than others. So the radiology example was happened 10 years ago because it didn't get paid for, it just was ease of use. And all your radiology went overseas, they looked at it, sent it back, and it, you just did, you didn't even know it, right? So as you start to see some of the use cases that are uh, the subspecialties, uh, especially in behavioral health or some of the surger, surgeons or um, some of the neurosurgeons, they're, they're such a subspecialty, which means there's not very many of them. That is, that's where the adoption is super high. Uh, and in some cases, they need really high bandwidth because they're looking at ama you know, all kinds of things to help diagnose or, or help another patient globally, not a patient, another physician. Um, so for many years, it was physician to physician because it didn't matter, right? Because they got paid for that. That's a consultation. They got paid for it. So they used a lot of that. And then as they started to get down, okay, I don't need all of that to be able to do it over the phone. I don't have to go home to look at this. That kind of stuff. So it really has to do with the use case and the center that you're part of and their view of it. If you are part of the Cleveland Clinic, you have a very different uh, view because of the management of it than a smaller facility in South Carolina that might not quite be worried about that yet um, because they're just trying to take care of their community. And to Nancy's point, having worked with the, you know, the internet too and the research community, you know, the top research doctors, you know, those hospitals, those facilities, the university medical centers, they have the connectivity that they need. Again, it's getting that connectivity out to the doctor in that, you know, that remote South Carolina hospital. So, please go back. Oh, sorry. Uh, as far as security, and this is for Nancy, you know, my wife is a nurse practitioner as well, and, and the HIPAA laws are, are very stringent. Is there anything inside of HIPAA that, that basically forces a network to be secure to protect that data? And is that maybe a reason yeah. why people aren't using it? Uh, I don't think it's the, so. Let me, so HIPAA is um, you've all signed it every time you've gone to a doctor, right? It, it's really the sharing of your personal information wherever it should be. So the HIPAA regulations are tip, are purposely void, and everyone, every lawyer in the world has said this is how you should look at it. Um, but it's really about the protected health information or PHI. So if the data coming back and forth has no consideration of that, that's Nancy Green's information. It's not, for, it's not under um, the HIPAA regulations. If you're just transmitting and you're not storing. So a video, virtual video, is you don't have to go by HIPAA laws because you're not storing the video. The minute, as a service provider, the minute you store something, then now that data center has to be secure, all of that kind of stuff. The transport piece, Verizon or any fiber, uh, there's a transport exception in the HIPAA laws because you're just transporting. Right? But the minute you start to touch it, look at it, manipulate it, then the HIPAA laws start to come through. So data centers have to be HIPAA compliant. The person that will get the fine will be the hospital system. They are the uh, covered entity. 
uh, and you, by business associate agreement, will get pulled into that lawsuit. But it, I don't think it stopped adoption because of that. The security piece of it is um, everyone's super worried about that. So well, the, I mean, I, uh, if I may, because please, I mean, security and thinking about security, I mean, there's multiple levels. But yes, as you yeah. go to adopting wireless, and this device and this device becomes more potent in terms of healthcare uh, potential capabilities, you're transmitting all this stuff wirelessly. Right. And when you think about a generation of people that grow up just like, we, we, I'm old enough not to be digital. I learned to be digital. My kids are digital. They were born with that, essentially, gene in, their, <laughs> in them, right? So the, they would expect this or some similar device to actually do a lot of the things so they don't have to go to the doctor. I mean, if I don't have to go to the doctor, if I could do it through this, I would do Absolutely. it gladly. That's why it's important when you're, but, when you're making those that nothing resides on the device. And so we do a lot of that consultation is don't have anything reside on the device. Everything's in the cloud or remote. So it but, is a use as a transport piece, but, um, you know. But, but once yeah. you go wireless, it makes it a lot easier to grab that data off the air, I think, that if you have a physical connectivity. So uh, it, it, as a covered roaming, entity, essentially. As a covered entity, though, trying to comply with HIPAA, one of, the, one, of the, one of the pieces of due diligence would be to encrypt everything. Yep, absolutely. And encryption does come with a bandwidth tax. Mm -hmm. So do we have the, does the infrastructure have the capacity of handling totally encrypted traffic? Yes. Cliff? Well, it, it can and does. It depends on where and, yeah. and how. Um, but I was, what I was thinking about while this conversation was going on was, uh, as you know, telemedicine uh, expands and over the future. I mean, how are you going to keep these? How are you going to keep this fluid and keep these records uh, you know, private? And I, I think you know, actually, blockchain is going to play a huge role mm. coming into into that uh, into focus in the next few years, as it will with you know, many other uh, you know, many other sectors. Uh, but um, you know, I think the uh, uh, the ability to keep it fluid is is key, right? So you wanted to have uh, you know the the, uh, the patient and uh, and the doctor interacting, uh, you know, on a real time basis. And how do you do that on, on, on a scale that's you know massive? Uh, again, I would say it goes back to the edge. And, and then I think one of the ways to keep all those records safe is by using blockchain as the uh, storage and forward technology. So every, we have a question back here, please. Um, so so far, uh, a lot of the conversation has been uh, geared around kind of the, uh, the patient provider experience. Um, and I don't know if we're going to segue, but my question is more around the kind of big data and IoT. And uh, how are hospitals kind of uh, adapting to IoT? How are they using it? And are they doing? How are they adapting to managing the large data sets that come from it? And how does that affect the folks? It's a good question because, you know, the question, just to repeat for those that didn't hear, is what is the impact of the adoption rate of IoT within clinical settings and what's the impact on the infrastructure? I would ask how you define IoT first. Uh, smart devices that are pulling back data to some central point and hopefully organizations utilizing that. Data. So, so clinical smart devices yeah. or non-clinical? Yeah. Clinical. Okay. Just clarifying. <laughs> So it does, I mean. It makes a difference. Well, yeah. look, you know, just look at it as healthcare devices, whether clinical or non-clinical, that, you know, there's going to be a number of non-clinical devices that are going to be feeding healthcare information into clinical devices or clinical systems that will get aggregated up into big data. So if you look at that as a derivative of the 20 to 50 billion IP-enabled devices that are going to be online in the next five to seven years, it's a huge amount. These, these IoT devices are huge just packet generators. Yeah, so I think first, the reason I asked is that when she, uh, clinical has to go through the FDA if it touches the patient, right? So they're very regulated. Uh, so you can't just add something to a clinical device. You have to go th back through everything. So if you're going to add, an I, and we work with all the major manufacturers on devices, um, every Philips Respiron, Res, uh, Respironics device for sleep apnea, there's several million of them, all have a little chip on them that sends information back to Philips that says where it is, did you use it, what it is, and they're sending that information to your physician. So it's use-based, so lots of clinical stuff is done. Non-clinical, um, it's kind of, I call it the Wild West. You can do lots of stuff with it, but it doesn't matter if the information doesn't make sense or give context to someone else. So the question in IoT, and I was on the IoT panel earlier, we talked about 
in healthcare, it's a lot around um, asset tracking and what's called cold chain, which is temperature. So is the blood bank correct? Um, are the pharmaceuticals being kept at a certain temperature? Um, in the pharma space itself, it's globally tracking the, the uh, drug so that it's the right drug as it goes through. There's no counterfeit drugs, things like that. Um, and so that's their IoT world in, in that space, is really looking at how do I take all of this information. The hospital systems run on their electronic health records, and the electronic health records don't have fields for a lot of this data. So physician, none of that data is in there, and there's only trusted data in there, and they don't trust anything else that they don't know a person touched. So it makes a difference in, like your Fitbit, if it goes directly in, it goes, so there's some, heart monitors that you can actually adjust the numbers. They don't trust that data, so they don't even look at it. Yeah. So, why, why is there no trust in the data? I'm sorry? Why is there no trust? No, not if they're data. a physician, they can make a bad medical decision and be sued on data that they don't trust. So, so to elaborate on this, Nancy yeah. was on a uh, panel this morning. She talked about how the healthcare industry has been somewhat slow in uh, getting to the technology, which I couldn't agree with more. Uh, I think it's part of this is generational. <laughs> I hope my father-in-law is not watching this ever, but he, you know, he because we were dragging through the mud. Um, but uh, but certainly there's a there's a certain number of physicians out there that just aren't comfortable with technology, and they're going to be retiring, and you have a whole another generation who are more uh, comfortable with it. They're going to be using it. In addition to that, these hospitals, I think, are realizing in order to be competitive and give the level of care that, that is required, and it is competitive, then they need to do the uh, work with the Internet of Things, and they need to work with technology, and they're actually having positions you know, uh, where they have someone in their hospital, and that's their job, right. is to work with departments. And there's a huge success factor when, when hospitals do that versus just saying, oh, we'll let each department roll it out themselves. That doesn't work as well. So you need somebody to be the champion within your your hospital for all these types of things. And it's going to be a process uh, that we can continue to go forward. Yeah, and I think people in the, in the room, I've heard a lot of data center conversations. Most hospitals don't have, their data centers don't have any of their patient information in it. What they're storing is non-clinical patient information because they don't trust it. Right? They don't trust anybody coming out of it. The breaches that happen in healthcare are not into that system. There's someone's lost laptop or an insider doing damage. So, you know, as, as you look at the data centers, that's why you're getting so much fiber into a building. It's their own center, their own stuff. And what they offload is storage or non-clinical applications. Do we have another question in the back? Oh, well, I mean, I was just going to, and now that you brought that up, so what do they, where do they store the clinical? On site, they have their own data centers on site. They manage. Okay, because I have, I mean, kind of along the lines of the telemedicine. I broke my ankle, and luckily, um, my husband was able, they told me I had that surgery that night. Luckily, my husband was able to call a friend who was a radiologist somewhere else. He tapped into it within five minutes and saw my x ray. And he was completely somewhere else. How was he able to do that? So, a couple of things. He had rights to do that. So, so he couldn't have gotten into that hospital system without rights to get into the access. So, he was already connected. He already had rights. So, physicians have rights into their into different facilities. Most physicians have multiple facilities that they work out of, and they have rights to do that. And they have a login to get it. That's very secure in how they do that. The you know they, that's what the biggest complaint is because it times out after like 10 seconds, and they have to re-log in again. Um, so, that's probably one of their biggest issues. I mean, it just seems like, you know, um, having um, second opinions, you know, whenever yeah. you're doing something major or whatever, being able to access somebody remotely quickly sure. would be, and it's just where the roadblocks to all of that. Yeah, I, I think I always say this, and, and I, if, if there was some money in it, I would do it. You have to be your own advocate as a patient. You just absolutely have to question. Um, just like, it's like, why is it taking so long or what else can I do? Um, if you run under the premise and understand that the healthcare industries, well, I should say health providers, when you talk about healthcare, there's also payers, but um, the providers think they own your information, which is why they don't let anybody look at it. It's your information. It's not theirs. So there's always this kind of butt up against who owns the information and where it goes. So. All right, so we have time for a couple more questions. Let's go on down front here. Uh, yeah, in terms of the discussion talking about uh, the supply, 
uh, prices that I had about it. And a lot of what was discussed was around either match, better matching demand and supply in terms of locations or uh, in terms of improving the, the patient journey or patient experience. But is telemedicine actually able to increase the supply in, in any way? And to, to elaborate on this, uh, because uh, telemedicine is in a way a slightly inferior experience uh, in terms of delivery, might be, will it actually generate a decrease in supply because the process will have to be redone uh, multiple times. So for every number of telemedicine visits, the patient will actually have to see the, uh, the doctor himself. Well, it's it's There's it's already studies that have proved it's actually more effective. I was going to say, you know, it, how many times do you have something where, you, where you're sick? You know, the patient experience, you know, from, will increase the supply because you'll be more willing to interact with your health care provider. You know, it, I had a surgery and I had to have, you know, something checked out. I could have waited a week to go to the doctor, but I called him up and I knew he had an iPhone. And I said, look, I know this is out of the practice, but I'd rather not come to the ER on a Sunday night at 9 o'clock just to check this incision site. Can you look at it? Right? And then the education was, well, I can't do that because of HIPAA, right? And I said, no, this is real time. There's no records, there's no storage, there's no nothing. That advocacy, that understanding of that patient experience will make you not reluctant to engage with your healthcare provider, to not be part of the healthcare system. It's something that you avoid, like going to the dentist, right? I mean, it, you know, it, if I could have my tooth checked without having to get it drilled, that'd be great. But from a regular health involvement, if the process, if I knew it wasn't going to take eight hours to get you know, somebody to look at this, I don't think it's broken, right? EMT for eight, you know, 10 years. I don't think this is broken, but it's my daughter, I'm gonna have them check it out. It's probably not, but I know that's eight hours of my day gone. Yeah, if it's my hand, I'm gonna wait till tomorrow morning and make an appointment. So, uh, actually, that will increase the demand for the service. Absolutely. But how, how will, the, is some of this enable to the supply. Yeah. So uh, Larry started off speaking about the, the supply being an issue. So basically, uh, is, uh, is Thomas able to make uh, physicians significantly more efficient? I don't know about significantly more efficient. Um, so the supply of physicians is going down the same with nursing. So they have to become more efficient. Uh, and we're always advocating um, for them teaching in medical school how to be a technologist as well as a healthcare provider so that they learn that. Um, but the interaction between a patient and a, a physician, you have to remember, they cannot diagnose over telemedicine. So, you know, they can do follow-ups, they can see you initially, but they're never going to, they're going to say, hang up, go to the ER right now um, because they can instantly tell what's going on. So. Uh, the challenge, to your point, I think we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, the challenge is to help those physicians become enabled to do more visits. So if you think about you only get five or ten minutes uh, and you waited four hours to see him or her, uh, that's because they're backed up and uh, because they're, they're scheduling too much. So their problem is always, well, i got to start my day an hour early so I can see two more patients. Well, virtu uh, video normally, virtual video under telemedicine, is very quick. So they can actually see 10 or 12 patients uh, in that same time that they probably only saw two or three patients. So, but some physicians won't do it. And that's just, that's just the way they are. All right, one more question. So two questions. Where does the crux lie? I mean, I can understand the liability aspect, but that's based upon the sensor data, essentially, from remote diagnostics. So it, where is the crux within that in order to make it viable when you can have remote diagnostics through telemedicine? The second question is, with I mean, there's, there's just a big movement for disaggregation away from big hospitals and move to clinics and that sort of stuff. And some states have started to take policies around uh, fines, or insurance companies as well, fines around um, you know, situations where somebody goes to the ER for a non-emergency <clears throat> set. Are those sorts of monetary funding kind of penalties going to drive more uh, telemedicine to The carrot and the stick work sometimes, you know, but that's, that's the carrot and the stick to the patient, not the clinician. Mm -hmm. So the patient pays more when they go to the emergency room rather than going and waiting the next time or using virtual visits. That's a training issue on making sure that the payer communicates that. Um, to, I think your first question, when you, when you look at remote patient monitoring, remote patient monitoring is um, monitoring biometrics. Uh, so 
you know, uh, weight scale, blood pressure, pulse ox, those kinds of things. That's information that a physician can use to help make a diagnosis or help um, uh, prevent something. So your blood pressure went up in three days, it shouldn't have been, you're now red, nurse calls you, what happened, what'd you do, because you're a CHF patient. So it's more preventative than anything else. And for a long time, payers didn't pay for that. Because if you think about it, how, and I don't normally do this if we have time, you are, uh, your lifespan at a payer is short. So your lifespan at your employer is longer traditionally than it is at your payer. So think about it, how many times have you changed payers in your jobs or whatever, right? So for them, if they, unfortunately, I should tell, are there any people that in the payer business in the room? <laughs> that your longevity isn't their biggest concern. It should be yours and it's, you know, your, as your employer or whatever. So, so I've been at Verizon eight years, we've had two big insurance company moves. So uh, when, you, when you think about that, and your records don't come from the old insurance company, by the way. So it, it's, it's about trying to understand how that remote patient monitoring really makes a monetary difference for reimbursement. So, That's what I was trying to get to. We are already over time, believe oh, it or not. I so I do want to close out on one question because you know, and there's a lot of topics we didn't get to with the impact of SD-WAN, of 5G networks. Uh, we did touch on IoT, but none of this happens without the underlying network being able to transport all this data around. As the providers of those networks, how is it that you are going to make sure, make sure that they are not only reliable, uh, available, but reliable? Because downtime is the enemy of service in this regard. So. To the panelists, we'll use this as our as our walk off. I will not say a word. <laughs> well, I guess I'll start as a fiber provider. Um, you know, quality network is really important for us. So we make sure that we build it uh, ourselves always, uh, so we know exactly what we built, so we can maintain the quality of it. Um, and then, you know, we want to make sure that we're nimble enough for these hospitals, um, so that when they say, "I want a route between here and here." We're not going to build it the way we want it. We're going to work with the hospital to figure out, okay, maybe we build it a little longer for you because it's diverse from your other route that you have from somebody else. Um, so having that sort of entrepreneurial, you know, very custom-made network is, is pretty important for our vertical there. I, I, I would add that um, this is, you know, my conversation about the edge before I think is uh, very important. And as the edge uh, um, intensifies uh, because of 5G, IoT, uh, you're going to want to try to keep as much transactional activity on the edge as possible. So in terms of building resilient networks, you're going to have pockets of, uh, of data centers or exchanges or meeting rooms or combined where, where wireline and, and wireless services uh, can interconnect. And you can you know, buy some smart technologies like SDN, uh, maybe even AI, NFC, NFV. Um, you, know, you can push or keep a lot of the non uh, uh, you know, non-core type traffic on the edge. And I think that's, that creates resiliency. And of course, these, these pockets or these, uh, uh, these gateways are then interconnected in a mesh topology, which even more promotes resilience. Networks fail. I mean, we, any of us that, that manage networks know that there are elements that are, you know, that you cannot control. Cars are gonna crash into poles, things are going to go down. What we've found, so Adtel runs the fiber school, and we've worked with a, a private carrier on deployment as they have grown their network. And what they've found is that the critical components of project management and documentation on the back end when it comes time to repair, you know, proper training of the project managers, proper documentation and closeout packages you know, that are communicated through to the NOC and the people at the NOC being able to re read that information results in a 30% reduction in mean time to repair. Those are hard numbers. <coughs> Bill, last word. Um, well said. Yeah. For sure. We build the networks uh, with uh, inherent uh, arch architectures that actually help, you know, alleviate issues when they do happen. But at the end of the day, uh, the two things. At the end of the day, I mean, it comes down to economics. If someone doesn't want to pay for that redundancy, there's no way that we're going to put that in unless we're compensated. And that's a stark reality. We're dealing with investors, whether private equity or not, that want to see a return on their money. So that's one aspect of it that's challenging. You know, if you're a smaller entity, if you're a larger entity, you get, you pay for it because you understand the requirement, right, and the impact if it doesn't happen. The second aspect is once you get to the, 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 the real edge, which is at the consumer level, is a broadband connection that you have, whether it's wireless or wireline into your home or your office, essentially that is inherently not redundant. 
uh, at the end of the day, right? So you have to think about that impact when it comes down to that individual user. Wireless is probably better because you can, uh, uh, their networks tend to be a little more resilient uh, than let's say your typical cable operator or someone similar to that that drives fiber or coax into a home. But that, that's a single point of failure that you cannot avoid unless you also have the wireless backup. So it kind of works itself. But I go back to as a service provider, it comes down to economics. We can provide the best service in the world, but somebody has to pay for it. We're not going to do it for free because we have investors. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending today's roundtable. I want to thank our panelists, Nancy Green, Drew Mullen, Cliff Kane, Phil Alvarez, and Brian Prophet. Great conversation. And I, I don't want to be cliche and wishing everybody good health. <laughs>